The stranger came to Iping early in February, one wintry day through a biting wind and a driving snow. Walking from Bramblehurst railway station and carrying a little black portmanteau in his thickly gloved hand. He was wrapped up from head to foot and the brim of his soft felt hat hid every inch of his face save the shiny tip of his nose. The snow had piled itself against his shoulders and chest and added a white crest to the burden he carried. He staggered into the coach and horses more dead than alive and flung his portmanteau down. A fire, he cried, in the name of human charity. He stamped and shook the snow from off himself in the bar and followed Mrs. Hall into her guest parlour to strike his bargain. And with that much introduction, that and a couple of sovereigns flung down upon the table, he took up his quarters in the inn. Mrs. Hall lit the fire and served his lunch. Back in the kitchen, she found she'd forgotten the mustard pot. Putting it with some stateliness upon a gold and black tea tray, she carried it into the parlour. She knocked and entered promptly. As she did so, her visitor moved quickly so that she got but a glimpse of a white object disappearing behind the table. It would seem he was picking something from the floor. She wrapped down the mustard pot on the table, then she noticed the overcoat and hat that had been taken off and put over a chair in front of the fire. A pair of wet boots threatened to rust her steel fender. She went to these things resolutely. I suppose I may have them to dry now, she said, in a voice that brooked no denial. Leave the hat, said her visitor in a muffled voice. And turning, she saw he'd raised his head and was looking at her. For a moment she stood gazing at him, too surprised to speak. He held a white cloth, it was a serviette he'd brought with him, over the lower part of his face, so that his mouth and jaws were completely hidden, and that was the reason for his muffled voice. But it was not that which startled Mrs. Hall. It was the fact that all the forehead above the blue glasses was covered by a white bandage, and that another covered his ears, leaving not a scrap of his face exposed, except for his pink-peaked nose. It was bright pink and shining. He wore a dark brown velvet jacket with a high black linen-lined collar turned up about his neck. The thick black hair, escaping as it could below and between the cross bandages, projected in curious tails and horns, giving him the strangest appearance conceivable. This muffled and bandaged head was so unlike what she had anticipated that for a moment she was rigid. He didn't remove the serviette, but remained holding it as she saw now with a brown gloved hand and regarding her with his inscrutable blank glasses. Leave the hat, he said speaking indistinctly through the white cloth. Mrs. Hall shivered a little as she closed the door behind her, and her face was eloquent of her surprise and perplexity. When she went to clear away the stranger's lunch, he was sitting in the corner with his back to the window blind. I have some luggage at Bramblehurst station, he said, and asked how he could have it sent. He bowed his bandaged head quite politely in acknowledgement of her explanation. Tomorrow there is no speedier delivery. He seemed disappointed when she answered, No. You're certain that is the earliest? She was certain, with a marked coolness. Then she remembered the two sovereigns and how rare it was to have an out-of-season visitor. I should explain, he said, that I am an experimental investigator. Indeed, sir, said Mrs. Hall, much impressed. And my baggage contains apparatus and appliances. I'm naturally anxious to get on with my inquiries. Of course, sir. My reason for coming to Iping, he proceeded with a certain deliberation of manner, was a desire for solitude. I do not wish to be disturbed in my work. Also, an accident necessitates a certain retirement. My eyes are sometimes so weak and painful that I have to shut myself up in the dark for hours together. Lock myself up. Sometimes. Now and then. At such times, the slightest disturbance, the entry of a stranger into the room, is a source of excruciating annoyance to me. It is well these things should be understood. Certainly, sir, said Mrs. Hall. And if I might make so bold as to ask. That, I think, is all, said the stranger, with that quietly irresistible air of finality he could assume at will. So it was that on the ninth day of February, at the beginning of the thaw, this singular person fell out of infinity into Iping village. Next day, his luggage arrived through the slush, and very remarkable luggage it was. There were a couple of trunks, such as a rational man might have, 
But in addition, there were a box of books, big, fat books, of which some were in an incomprehensible handwriting, and a dozen or more crates, boxes and cases containing objects packed in straw. Glass bottles, as it seemed to Mrs. Hall's husband, tugging with a casual curiosity at the straw. The stranger, muffled in hat, coat, gloves and wrapper, came out impatiently to meet Fearenside's cart, while Hall was having a word or so of gossip before helping him to bring them in. Out came the stranger, not noticing Fearenside's dog. Come along with those boxes, he said. I've been waiting long enough. And he came down the steps towards the tail of the wagon, as if to lay hands on the smaller crate. No sooner had Fearenside's dog caught sight of him, however, than it began to bristle and growl savagely, and when he rushed down the steps it gave an undecided hop and then sprang straight at his hand. Lie down! Fearenside howled and snatched his whip. They saw the dog's teeth had slipped the hand, heard a kick, saw the dog execute a flanking jump and get home on the stranger's leg and heard the rip of his trousering. Then the finer end of Fearenside's whip reached its property, and the dog, yelping with dismay, retreated under the wheels of the wagon. It was all the business of a swift half-minute. The stranger glanced swiftly at his torn glove, then at his leg, made as if he would stoop to the latter, turned, and rushed up the steps into the inn. They heard him go headlong across the passage and up the uncarpeted stairs to his bedroom. Hall had stood gaping. He was bit, said Hall. I'd better go and see to him. And he trotted after the stranger. He met Mrs. Hall in the passage. Carry his dog, he said. Bitten. He went straight upstairs, and the stranger's door being ajar, he pushed it open and was entering without any ceremony, being of a naturally sympathetic turn of mind. The blind was down and the room dim. He caught a glimpse of a most singular thing. What seemed a handless arm moving towards him, and a face of three huge indeterminate spots on white, very like the face of a pale pansy. Then he was struck violently in the chest, hurled back, and the door slammed in his face and locked. It was so rapid that it gave him no time to observe. There he stood on the dark little landing, wondering what it might be that he'd seen. After a couple of minutes, he rejoined the little group that had formed outside the coach and horses. There was fear inside, telling about it all over again for the second time. There was Mrs. Hall saying his dog didn't have no business to bite her guests. There was Huxter, the general dealer from over the road, interrogative. There was Sandy Wadgers from the forge, judicial. Besides women and children, all of them saying fatuities. Mr. Hall, staring at them from the steps and listening, found it incredible that he'd seen anything so very remarkable happen upstairs. Besides, his vocabulary was altogether too limited for his impressions. He don't want no help, he said, in answer to his wife's inquiry. We'd better be taking of his luggage in. Suddenly, the dog began growling again. Come along, cried an angry voice in the doorway. And there stood the muffled stranger with his collar turned up and his hat brim bent down. The sooner you get those things in, the better I'll be pleased. Was you hurt, sir, said Fear inside. I'm rare sorry, the dog. Not a bit, said the stranger. Never broke the skin. Hurry up with those things. Directly the first crate was carried into the parlour, the stranger flung himself upon it with extraordinary eagerness and began to unpack it, scattering the straw with an utter disregard for Mrs. Hall's carpet, and from it he began to produce bottles. Little fat bottles containing powders, small and slender bottles containing coloured and white fluids, fluted green bottles labelled poison, bottles with round bodies and slender necks, large blue glass bottles, large white glass bottles, bottles with glass stoppers and frosted labels, bottles with fine corks, bottles with bungs, bottles with wooden caps, wine bottles and salad oil bottles. He assembled them in rows, on the chiffonier, on the mantel, on the table under the window, round the door, on the bookshelf, everywhere. The chemist's shop at Bramblehurst couldn't boast half so many. At last, all six crates were empty, and the table was piled high with straw. The only things that came out of these crates besides bottles were a number of test tubes and a carefully packed balance. And directly the crates were unpacked, the stranger went to the window and set to work, not troubling in the least about the litter of straw. When Mrs. Hall took his dinner into him, he was already so absorbed in his work, pouring little drops out of the bottles into the test tubes, 
that he didn't hear her until she had swept away the bulk of the straw and put the tray on the table, with some little emphasis, perhaps, seeing the state the floor was in. Then he half turned his head and immediately turned it away again. But she saw he'd removed his glasses. They were beside him on the table, and it seemed to her that his eye sockets were extraordinarily hollow. He put on his spectacles again and then turned and faced her. I wish you wouldn't come in without knocking, he said, in the tone of abnormal exasperation that seemed so characteristic of him. I knocked, but seemingly. Perhaps you did. But in my investigations, my really very urgent and necessary investigations, the slightest disturbance, the jar of a door, I must ask you. Certainly, sir. You can turn the lock if you like that, you know, any time. Very good idea, said the stranger. This straw, sir, if I might make so bold as to remark, don't. If the straw makes trouble, put it down on the bill. He was so odd, standing there, so aggressive and explosive, bottle in one hand and test tube in the other, that Mrs. Hall was quite alarmed. But she was a resolute woman. In which case, I should like to know, sir, what you consider... A shilling. Put down the shilling. Surely a shilling's enough? So be it, said Mrs. Hall. All the afternoon he worked with the door locked. Once there was a concussion and the sound of bottles ringing together as though the table had been hit and a smash of glass flung violently down and then a rapid pacing athwart the room. Fearing something was the matter, Mrs. Hall went to the door and listened, not caring to knock. Can't go on, he was muttering. Can't go on. Cheated. All my life it may take me. Patience. Patience indeed. Fool. Fool. There was a noise of hobnails on the bricks in the bar, and Mrs. Hall very reluctantly had to leave the rest of his soliloquy. When she returned, the room was silent again, save for the faint creaking of his chair and the occasional clink of a bottle. When she took in his tea, she saw broken glass in the corner of the room and a golden stain that had been carelessly wiped. She called attention to it. Put it down in the bill, snapped the visitor. For God's sake, don't worry me. If there's damage done, put it down in the bill. I'll tell you something, said Fear Inside, the carrier, mysteriously. It was late in the afternoon, and they were in the little beer shop of Iping Village, he and Teddy Henfrey, the clock mender. Well, said Teddy, this chap at the coach and horses, what my dog bit, well, he's... he's black. This way his legs are. I seed through the tear of his trousers and the tear of his glove. You'd have expected a sort of pinky to show, wouldn't you? Well, there wasn't none. Just blackness. I tell you, he's as black as my hat. My sake, said Henfrey, he's a rummy case altogether. Why, his nose is as pink as paint. That's true, said Veer inside. I knows that. And I tell you what I'm thinking. That man's piebald, Teddy. Black here, white there, in patches. He's kind of half-breed. And the colours come off patchy instead of mixing. I've heard of such things before, and it's the common way with horses, as anyone can see. And I tell you something, he's ashamed of it. A curious stranger had arrived in the Sussex village of Iping one snowy night in February, and taken up residence with Mrs. Hall at the Coach and Horses Inn. There were a number of skirmishes with Mrs. Hall in matters of domestic discipline, but in every case, until late in April, when the first signs of penury began, the stranger overrode her by the easy expedient of extra payment. Mr. Hall didn't like him, and whenever he dared, he talked of the advisability of getting rid of him. Wait till the summer, said Mrs. Hall sagely, when the artists are beginning to come. Then we'll see. He may be a bit overbearing, but Bill settled punctual is Bill settled punctual, whatever you likes to say. The stranger didn't go to church, and indeed made no difference between Sunday and irreligious days, even in costume. He worked, as Mrs. Hall thought, very fitfully. Some days he would come down early and be continuously busy. On others he would rise late, pace his room, fretting audibly for hours together, smoke or sleep in the armchair by the fire. Communication with the world beyond the village he had none. His temper continued very uncertain. 
For the most part, his manner was that of a man suffering under almost unendurable provocation, and once or twice things were snapped, torn, crushed or broken in spasmodic gusts of violence. His habit of talking to himself in a low voice grew steadily upon him, but though Mrs. Hall listened conscientiously, she could make neither head nor tail of what she heard. He rarely went abroad by day, but at twilight he would go out muffled up enormously, whether the weather was cold or not, and he chose the loneliest paths and those most overshadowed by trees and banks. His goggling spectacles and ghastly bandaged face under the penthouse of his hat came with a disagreeable suddenness out of the darkness upon one or two home-going labourers. It was inevitable that a person of so remarkable an appearance and bearing should form a frequent topic in such a village as Iping. Opinions were greatly divided about his occupation. Mrs. Hall was sensitive on the point. When questioned, she explained very carefully that he was an experimental investigator, going gingerly over the syllables as one who dreads pitfalls. When asked what an experimental investigator was, she would say with a touch of superiority that most educated people knew such things as that, and would then explain that he discovered things. Her visitor had had an accident, she said, which temporarily discoloured his face and hands, and being of a sensitive disposition, he was averse to any public notice of the fact. Out of her hearing, there was a view largely entertained that he was a criminal trying to escape justice by wrapping himself altogether from the eye of the police. This idea sprang from the brain of Mr. Teddy Henfrey, but no crime of any magnitude dating from the middle or end of February was known to have occurred. Another theory of his was that the stranger was an anarchist in disguise, preparing explosives. He resolved to undertake such detective operations as his time permitted. These consisted for the most part in looking very hard at the stranger whenever they met, or in asking people who had never seen the stranger leading questions about him. But he detected nothing. Sussex folk have few superstitions, and it was only after the events of early April that the thought of the supernatural was first whispered in the village. Even then, it was only credited among the women folk. The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the medium of the vicar and his wife. It occurred in the small hours of Whit Monday, the day devoted in Iping to the club festivities. Mrs. Bunting woke up suddenly with a strong impression that the door of their bedroom had been opened and closed. She didn't arouse her husband at first, but sat up in bed listening. She then distinctly heard the pad, pad of bare feet coming out of the adjoining room and walking along the passage towards the staircase. So soon as she felt assured of this, she aroused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. He went out onto the landing to listen. He heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on at his study desk downstairs, and then a violent sneeze. At that, he returned to his bedroom, armed himself with the most obvious weapon, the poker, and descended the staircase as noiselessly as possible. Mrs. Bunting came out onto the landing. The hour was about four, and the ultimate darkness of the night was past. There was a faint shimmer of light in the hall, but the study doorway yawned impenetrably black. Everything was still except the faint creaking of the stairs under Mr. Bunting's tread and the slight movements in the study. Then something snapped. The drawer was opened and there was a rustle of papers. Then came an imprecation and a match was struck and the study was flooded with yellow light. Mr. Bunting was now in the hall and through the crack in the door he could see the desk and the open drawer and a candle burning on the desk. But the robber he couldn't see. He stood there in the hall, undecided what to do, and Mrs. Bunting, her face white and intent, crept slowly downstairs after him. They heard the chink of money, and realised that the robber had found a housekeeping reserve of gold, two pounds ten in half sovereigns altogether. At that sound, Mr. Bunting was nerved to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room, closely followed by Mrs. Bunting. Surrender! cried Mr. Bunting fiercely, and then stopped, amazed. Apparently the room was perfectly empty. For half a minute, perhaps, they stood gasping. Then Mrs. Bunting went across the room and looked behind the screen, while Mr. Bunting, by a kindred impulse, peered under the desk. Then Mrs. Bunting turned back the window curtains, and Mr. Bunting looked up the chimney and probed it with the poker. 
Then Mrs. Bunting scrutinised the waste paper basket and Mr. Bunting opened the coal scuttle. Then they came to a stop and stood with eyes interrogating one another. I could have sworn, said Mr. Bunting. The candle. Who lit the candle? Of all the extraordinary occurrences. There was a violent sneeze in the passage. Bring the candle, said Mr. Bunting, and led the way. They both heard the sound of bolts in the kitchen being hastily shot back. As Mr. Bunting opened the door into the kitchen, he saw through the scullery that the back door was just opening, and the faint light of early dawn displayed the dark masses of the garden beyond. He was certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was bringing from the study flickered and flared. The kitchen was empty. They refastened the back door, examined the kitchen, pantry and scullery in detail, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house, search as they would. Daylight found the vicar and his wife, a quaintly costumed little couple, still marvelling about on their own ground floor by the unnecessary light of a guttering candle. Now, it happened that in the early hours of Whit Monday, Mr. and Mrs. Hall both rose and went noiselessly into the cellar. Their business there was of a private nature and had to do with the specific gravity of their beer. They had hardly entered the cellar when Mrs. Hall found she had forgotten to bring down a bottle of sarsaparilla from their joint room. As she was the expert and principal operator in this affair, Hall very properly went upstairs for it. On the landing, he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. He went on into his own room and found the bottle as he had been directed, but as he came downstairs, he noticed that the bolts on the front door had been shot back, that the door was in fact simply on the latch. And with a flash of inspiration, he connected this with the stranger's room upstairs and the suggestion of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot those bolts overnight. At the sight, he stopped, gaping. Then, with the bottle still in his hands, went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door. There was no answer. He rapped again. He pushed the door wide open and entered. It was as he expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was queerer, even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the bandages and garments of their guest, the only clothes they had ever seen him wear. Even his big slouched hat was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there, he heard his wife's voice coming out of the depths of the cellar. He turned and hurried down to her. Janny, t'was truth what Envry says. He's not in his room yet. And the front door is unbolted. At first Mrs. Hall didn't understand. And so soon as she did, she resolved to see the empty room for herself. Hall went first. If he ain't there, he said, his clothes are... And what's he doing without his clothes, then? It is a most curious business. As they came up the cellar stairs, they both, it was afterwards ascertained, fancied they heard the front door open and shut. But seeing it closed and nothing there, neither said a word to the other about it at the time. Mrs. Hall passed her husband in the passage and ran on first upstairs. Someone sneezed on the staircase. Hall, following six steps behind, thought that he heard her sneeze. She, going on first, was under the impression Hall was sneezing. She flung open the door and stood regarding the room. Up off the curious, she said. She heard a sniff close behind her, as it seemed, and turning was surprised to see Hall a dozen feet off on the topmost stair. She bent forward and put her hand on the pillow and under the clothes. Cold, she said. He's been up this hour or more. As she did so, a most extraordinary thing happened. The bedclothes gathered themselves together, leapt up suddenly into a sort of peak, and then jumped headlong over the bottom rail. It was exactly as if a hand had clutched them in the centre and flung them aside. Immediately after, the stranger's hat hopped off the bedpost, described a whirling flight in the air through the better part of a circle, and then dashed straight at Mrs Hall's face. Then, as swiftly, came the sponge from the washstand. And then the chair, laughing dryly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with its four legs at Mrs. Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and charged at her. She screamed and turned, and then the chair legs came gently and firmly against her back and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. The chair and bed seemed to be executing a dance of triumph for a moment, and then, abruptly, everything was still. 
Mrs. Hall was left almost in a fainting condition in Mr. Hall's arms on the landing. It was with the greatest difficulty that Mr. Hall succeeded in getting her downstairs and applying the restoratives customary in such cases. "'Tis spirits,' says Mrs. Hall. "'I know, tis spirits. I've read in papers of them. Tables and chairs leaping and dancing.' "'Take a drop more, Jenny,' said Mr. Hall, "'till steady.' "'Lock him out,' said Mrs. Hall. "'Don't let him come in again.' I half guessed I might have known, with them goggling eyes and bandaged head and never going to church of a Sunday, and all they bottles, more than it's right for anyone to have. He's put the spirits into the furniture, my good old furniture. Twas in that very chair my poor dear mother used to sit when I was a little girl. To think it should rise up against me now. Suddenly, the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord, and as they looked up in amazement, they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger, staring more blackly and blankly than ever with those unreasonably large glass eyes of his. He came down stiffly and slowly, staring all the time. Then he entered the parlour and suddenly, swiftly, viciously, slammed the door in their faces. Not a word was spoken until the last echoes of the slam had died away. They stared at one another. Go in and ask him about it, said Mrs. Hall to her husband. Demand an explanation. It took some time to bring the landlady's husband up to that pitch. At last he rapped, opened the door, and got as far as, Excuse me. Go to the devil, said the stranger in a tremendous voice, and shut that door after you. It was the finest of all possible Whit Mondays and Iping was alive with the club fair. After his appalling behaviour earlier in the day, Mrs Hall completely ignored the stranger who was lodging at the inn, even though he rang his bell several times for attendance. About noon, he suddenly opened his parlour door and stood glaring fixedly at the three or four people in the bar. Mrs Hall, he called. Mrs Hall appeared after an interval, a little short of breath, but all the fiercer for that. She had deliberated over this scene, and she came holding a little tray with an unsettled bill upon it. Is it your bill you'll be wanting, sir, she asked? Why wasn't my breakfast laid? Why haven't you prepared my meals and answered my bell? Do you think I live without eating? Why isn't my bill paid, said Mrs Hall. That's what I want to know. I told you three days ago I was awaiting a remittance. I told you three days ago I wasn't going to await no remittance. You can't grumble if your breakfast waits a bit, if my bill's been waiting these five days, can you? The stranger stood, looking more like an angry diving helmet than ever. It was universally felt in the bar that Mrs Hall had the better of him. His next word showed as much. Look here, my good woman, he began. Don't good woman me, said Mrs Hall. I've told you my remittance hasn't come. Still, I dare say, in my pocket. You told me three days ago that you hadn't nothing but a sovereign's worth of silver. Well, I've found some more. I wonder where you found it, said Mrs. Hall. That seemed to annoy the stranger very much. He stamped his foot. What do you mean, he said. That I wonder where you found it, said Mrs. Hall. And before I take any bills or get any breakfast, you've got to tell me one or two things I don't understand. I want to know what you've been doing to my chair upstairs. And I want to know how tis your room was empty and how you got in again. Them as stops in this house comes in by the doors. That's the rule of this house. And that you didn't do. And what I want to know is how you did come. And I want to know... Suddenly the stranger raised his gloved hands, stamped his foot again, and said, Stop! With such extraordinary violence that he silenced her instantly. You don't understand who I am or what I am. I'll show you. By heaven, I'll show you. Then he put his open palm over his face and withdrew it. The centre of his face became a black cavity. Here, he said. He stepped forward and handed Mrs. Hall something which she, staring at the metamorphosed face, accepted automatically. Then, when she saw what it was, she screamed loudly, dropped it and staggered back. The nose. It was the stranger's nose. Pink and shining, it rolled on the floor with the sound of hollow cardboard. He removed his spectacles, and everyone in the bar gasped. He took off his hat, and with a violent gesture tore at his whiskers and bandages. A flash of horrible anticipation passed through the bar. It was worse than anything. 
Mrs. Hall, standing open-mouthed and horror-struck, shrieked at what she saw and made for the door of the house. Everyone began to move. They were prepared for scars, disfigurement, tangible horrors, but nothing. The man who stood there, shouting some incoherent explanation, was a solid, gesticulating figure up to the coat collar of him, and then nothingness. No visible thing at all. People down the village heard shouts and shrieks, and looking up the street saw the coach and horses violently firing out its humanity. Then through the crowd came Mr Hall and Mr Bobby Jeffers, the village constable. They'd come armed with a warrant. Men and women shouted conflicting information of the recent circumstances. Aid or no aid, said Mr Jeffers. I got to Reston, and Reston I will. Mr Hall marched up the steps straight to the door of the parlour. Constable, he said, do your duty. As Jaffers entered the parlour, followed by Hall, they saw in the dim light the headless figure facing them, with a gnawed crust of bread in one gloved hand and a chunk of cheese in the other. That's him, said Hall. What the devil's this? came in a tone of angry expostulation from above the collar of the figure. You're a darn rum customer, mister, said Jaffers. But aid or no aid, the warrant says body and duty's duty. Keep away, said the figure, starting back. Off came his left glove and was slapped in Jaffa's face. In another moment, Jaffa's, cutting short some statement concerning a warrant, had gripped him by the handless wrist and caught his invisible throat. He got a resounding kick on the shin that made him shout, but he kept his grip. Get the feet, he shouted. Mr Hall, endeavouring to act on instruction, received a kick in the ribs that disposed of him for a moment. Then Mr Huckster, the grocer, weighed in to the rescue of law and order. I, I surrender, cried the stranger. He stood up, panting, a weird figure, headless and handless, for he'd pulled off his right glove now as well as his left. It's, it's no good, he said, as if sobbing for breath. It was the strangest thing in the world to hear that voice coming as if out of empty space. Jaffers got up also and produced a pair of handcuffs. Darn it, he said, brought up short by a dim realisation of the incongruity of the whole business. Can't use them, as I can see. The stranger ran his arm down his waistcoat, and as if by a miracle, the buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. Then he said something about his shin and stooped down. He seemed to be fumbling with his shoes and socks. The fact is, he said, I'm all here, head, legs and all the rest of it, but it happens I'm invisible. It's a confounded nuisance, but I am. The suit of clothes, now all unbuttoned and hanging loosely upon its unseen supports, stood up, arms akimbo. Several other men folk had now entered the room, so that it was closely crowded. Invisible, eh, said Huckster. Who ever heard the likes of that? It's strange, perhaps, but it's not a crime. Why am I assaulted by a policeman in this fashion? Ah, that's a different matter, said Jaffers. No doubt you are a bit difficult to see in this light, but I got a warrant and it's all correct. What I'm after ain't no invisibility, it's burglary. There's a house been broken into and money took. Well... And circumstances certainly point. Stuff and nonsense, said the invisible man. I hope so, sir, but I got my instructions. Abruptly, the figure sat down, and before anybody could realise what was being done, the slippers, socks and trousers had been kicked off under the table. Then he sprang up again and flung off his coat. Hold him, cried Jaffers loudly. Once he gets the things off, hold him, cried everyone. And there was a rush at the fluttering white shirt, which was now all that was visible of the stranger. The shirt sleeve planted a shrewd blow in Hall's face that stopped his open-armed advance and sent him backwards. Jaffers clutched at it and only helped to pull it off. Look out, said everyone, fencing at random and hitting at nothing. Hold him, shut the door. I got him, shouted Jaffers, choking and reeling through them all and wrestling with purple face and swelling veins against his unseen enemy. Men staggered right and left as the extraordinary conflict swayed towards the house door and went spinning down the steps of the inn. Jaffers cried in a strangled voice and fell heavily undermost with his head on the gravel. Only then did his fingers relax. Halfway across the road, a woman screamed as something pushed by her. A dog kicked, apparently, yelped and ran howling into Huxter's yard. And with that, the escape of the invisible man was accomplished. For a moment, People stood amazed and gesticulating, and then came panic, which scattered them abroad through the village as a gust scatters dead leaves. But Jaffers lay quite still, face and knees upward bent, at the foot of the steps of the inn.
Mr. Thomas Marvel was sitting with his feet in a ditch by the roadside about a mile and a half out of Iping. He wore a furry silk hat and the frequent substitution of twine and shoelaces for buttons, apparent at critical points of his costume, marked a man essentially bachelor. His feet, save for socks of irregular openwork, were bare. His big toes were broad and pricked like the ears of a watchful dog. In a leisurely manner, he was contemplating a pair of lace-up boots. They were the soundest boots he'd come across for a long time, but too large for him, whereas those he had were a very comfortable fit, but too thin-soled for damp. Mr. Thomas Marvel put the four boots in a graceful group on the turf and considered their respective merits. He was not at all startled by a voice behind him. They're boots anyhow, said the voice. They are charity boots, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. I've worn worse. In fact, I've worn none. But none so audacious ugly. I've got my boots in this county ten years or more, and then they treat you like this. It's a beast of a county, said the voice. Pigs for people. You're right, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his companion, and lo, where the boots of his companion should have been were neither legs nor boots. He turned his head over his shoulder to the left, and there also were neither legs nor boots. He was irradiated by the dawn of a great amazement. Where are you? said Mr. Thomas Marvel. He saw a stretch of empty down with the wind swaying the remote green-pointed furze bushes. Am I drunk? Was I, I talking to myself? Don't be alarmed, said the voice. Mr. Marvel rose sharply to his feet. Where are you? he demanded. Don't be alarmed, repeated the voice. Will you be alarmed in a minute? Where are you? Mr. Marvel paused. Are you uh, buried? There was no answer. It's the drink, muttered Mr. Marvel. It's not the drink, said the voice. You keep your nerves steady. I could have sworn I heard a voice, said Mr. Marvel, and his face grew white amidst its patches. Of course you did, said the voice. Listen, you think I'm just imagination. What else can you be? Very well. Then I'm going to throw flints at you till you think differently. But where are you? The voice made no answer. Whiz came a flint, apparently out of the air, and missed Mr. Marvel's shoulder by a hair's breadth. Turning, he saw a flint jerk up into the air, trace a complicated path, hang for a moment, and then fall at his feet with almost invisible rapidity. He was too amazed to dodge. Whiz came another, and ricocheted from a bare toe into a ditch. Mr. Marvel jumped a foot and howled aloud. Then he started to run, tripped over an unseen obstacle, and came head over heels into a sitting position. Now, said the voice, am I imagination? It's a fair do, said Mr. Marvel, taking his wounded toe in hand. I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves, stones talking. It's very simple. I'm an invisible man. That's all. I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand. I'm just a human being, solid, needing food and drink needing covering too, but I'm invisible. Understand? Invisible. Well, let's have a hand of you, said Marvel, if you are real. He felt the hand that had closed round his wrist with his disengaged fingers, and his touch went timorously up the arm and patted a muscular chest. How do you manage it, said the astonished Mr. Marvel. How the deuce is it done? It's too long a story. I need help. I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered. And I saw you. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is the man for me. I want you to help me get clothes and shelter, and then other things. I have chosen you. You are the only man, except for some of those fools down there, who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. An invisible man is a man of power. He stopped for a moment to sneeze violently. 
But if you betray me, he said, if you fail to do as I direct you, he paused and tapped Mr. Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr. Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. I don't want to betray you, he said. Don't you go and think it, Ned. All I want to do is help you. Just tell me what I got to do. The stranger, having demonstrated his invisibility and terrified the people of Iping, was wandering, hungry, enraged, and naked on the downs. There he encountered a tramp, Mr. Thomas Marvel, and forced him into his service. With Marvel's help, he stole money, retrieved his books, and forced the tramp to carry them. Mr. Marvel, however, was anything but happy with this arrangement, and spent a great deal of time trying to escape his unseen employer. When dusk was gathering, and Iping was just beginning to peep timorously forth again upon the shattered wreckage of its bank holiday, the two, the visible and the invisible, were marching through the twilight behind the beech woods on the road to Burdock. Marvel carried three books tied together and a bundle wrapped in a tablecloth. His rubicund face expressed consternation and fatigue, and he winced under the touch of unseen hands. If you give me the slip again, said the voice, if you attempt to give me the slip again, on my honour, I will kill you. The fact is, I have to make use of you. You're a poor tool, but I must. I'm a miserable tool, said Marvel. I'm the worst possible tool you could have. I wouldn't like to mess up your plans, you know, but I might, out of sheer funk and misery. You better not, said the voice, with quiet emphasis. I wish I was dead, said Marvel. Ain't no justice, he said. You must admit, seems to me I've a perfect right. Get on, said the voice. Mr. Marvel mended his pace, and for a time they went in silence again. It's devilish hard, said Mr. Marvel. This was quite ineffectual. He tried another tack. What do I, what do I make by it, he began. Oh, shut up, said the voice, with sudden amazing vigour. I'll see you're all right. You do what you're told. You're a fool and all that, but you do. I'll tell you, sir, I'm not the man for it. If you don't shut up, I shall twist your arm again, said the invisible man. I want to think. Presently, two oblongs of yellow light appeared through the trees, and the square tower of a church loomed through the darkness. I shall keep my hand on your shoulder, said the voice, all through this village. Go straight through and try no foolery. It will be the worse for you if you do. The unhappy-looking figure in the obsolete silk hat passed up the street of the little village with his burdens and vanished into the gathering darkness beyond the lights of the windows. Early next evening, Dr. Kemp was sitting in the Belvedere study of his house on the hill overlooking Burdock. The Belvedere, jutting from the house at first floor level, afforded an uninterrupted view of the little harbour, the town and the hill behind it. And Dr Kemp's eye, presently wandering from his work, caught the sunset blazing at the back of the hill. For a minute, perhaps, he sat, pen in mouth, admiring the rich golden colour above the crest. And then his attention was attracted by the little figure of a man running over the hill brow towards him. He was a shortish little fellow, and he was running so fast that his legs verily twinkled. Another of those asses, said Dr. Kemp. Like that ass who ran into me this morning with his visible man a coming, sir. I can't imagine what possesses people. One might think we were in the 13th century. He got up, went to the window, and stared at the dusky hillside and the dark little figure tearing down it. He seems in a confounded hurry, said Dr. Kemp. But he doesn't seem to be getting on. If his pockets were full of lead, he couldn't run heavier. The higher villas, clambering up the hill from Burdock, obscured the running figure. He was visible again for a moment, and again, and then again, three times between the three detached houses that came next, and then the terrace hit him. Asses, said Dr. Kemp, walking back to his writing table. But those who saw the fugitive nearer and perceived the abject terror on his perspiring face, did not share in the doctor's contempt. The man pounded, and as he ran, he chinked like a well-filled purse that's tossed to and fro. 
He looked neither to the right nor left, but his dilated eyes stared straight down the hill to where the lamps were being lit and the people were crowded in the street. All he passed stopped and began staring up the road and down and interrogating each other with an inkling of discomfort for the reason of his haste. And then, presently, far up the hill, something, a wind, a pad, 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 a sound like a panting breathing rushed by. People screamed. People sprang off the pavement. It passed in shouts. It passed by instinct down the hill. They were shouting in the street before Marvel was halfway there. They were bolting into houses and slamming the doors behind them with the news. He heard it and made one last desperate spurt. Fear came striding by, rushed ahead of him, and in a moment had seized the town. The Invisible Man is coming! The Invisible Man! The Jolly Cricketers is just at the bottom of the hill. The barman was leaning on the counter and talking of horses with a cabman, while a black-bearded man drank Burton and conversed in American with a policeman off duty. What's the shouting about, said the cabman. Somebody ran by outside. Fire, perhaps, said the barman. Footsteps approached, running heavily. The door was pushed open violently, and Marvel, weeping and dishevelled, his hat gone, the neck of his coat torn open, rushed in. He's coming, he bawled, his voice shrieking with terror. Invisible men! Out of me! For God's sake! Help! 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 Shut the door, said the policeman. Who's coming? What's the row? Let me go inside, said Marvel, and shrieked aloud as a blow suddenly made the fastened door shiver. He began to make frantic dives at panels that looked like doors. He killed me! He's got a knife or something! For God's sake! Here you are, said the barman. Come in here. And held up the flap of the bar. Mr. Marvel rushed through into the bar parlour as the summons outside was repeated. Don't open the door, he screamed. This, sir, uh, this invisible man, then, asked the American. I guess it's about time we saw him. The window of the inn was suddenly smashed in. There was a screaming and running in the street. Draw the bolts, said the American. And if he comes, he showed the revolver in his hand. From the bar parlour, Marvel's anxious face peered out. Are all the doors of the house shut? He's bound to be prowling round. He's as artful as the devil. Good Lord, said the barman. There's the back. There's the yard door and the private door. He rushed out of the bar, returning crestfallen a minute later. The yard door was open, he said. Maybe in the house now, said the cabman. The American replaced his revolver, and even as he did so, the flap of the bar was shut down, and the bolt clicked, and then, with a tremendous thud, the door behind the bar burst open into the parlour. They heard Marvel squeal like a court leveret, and the next moment he was curiously crumpled up and struggling against the door that led to the yard and the kitchen. It flew open, and Marvel was lugged into the kitchen. Head down and lugging back obstinately, he was forced towards the back door, and the bolts were drawn. The policeman rushed in, followed by the cabman, gripped the wrist of the invisible hand that collared Marvel, was hit in the face and went reeling back. But the cabman clutched something. I got him, he cried. Here he is. Mr. Marvel, released, suddenly dropped to the ground and made an attempt to crawl behind the legs of the fighting men. The voice of the invisible man was heard for the first time, yelling out sharply as the policeman trod on his foot. His invisible fists flew round like flails. Then the men in the kitchen found themselves struggling with empty air. Where's he gone, said the American. Out. This way, said the policeman, stepping into the yard. A piece of tile whizzed by his head. I'll show him, shouted the American, and suddenly a steel barrel shone over the policeman's shoulder, and six bullets followed one another into the twilight whence the missile had come. As he fired, the American moved his hand in a horizontal curve so that his shots radiated out into the narrow yard like spokes from a wheel. A silence followed. Six cartridges, said the American. Get a lantern, someone, and come and look for the body. Dr. Kemp had continued writing in his study until the shots came. Hello, said Dr. Kemp, who is letting off revolvers in Burdock? What are the asses at now? It must have been about an hour after this that the front doorbell rang. He'd been writing since the shots. He sat listening. He heard the servant answer the door, but she didn't come up. Was that a letter? He called over the balustrade. Only a runaway ring, sir, answered the housemaid. I'm restless tonight, he said to himself, and went back to his study to continue his work. It was two o'clock before he finished for the night and went upstairs to bed. He had already removed his coat when he noticed he was thirsty. He took a candle and went down to the dining room in search of a siphon and whiskey. 
Dr. Kemp's scientific pursuits had made him a very observant man, and as he recrossed the hall, he noticed a dark spot on the linoleum near the mat at the foot of the stairs. It occurred to him to ask himself what that spot might be, and bending down, he touched it. Without any great surprise, he found it had the stickiness and colour of drying blood. On the landing, he saw something else and stopped, astonished. The door handle of his room was blood-stained. He remembered that the door had been opened when he came down from his study and that consequently he had not touched the handle at all. He went straight into his room, his face quite calm, perhaps a trifle more resolute than usual, and his glance, wandering inquisitively, fell on the bed. On the counterpane was a mess of blood, and the sheet had been torn. On the further side, the bedclothes were depressed as if someone had recently been sitting there. He had an odd impression that he heard a low voice say, Good heavens, Kemp! But Dr. Kemp was no believer in voices. He stood staring at the tumbled sheets. Then he distinctly heard a movement near the washhand stand. All men, however highly educated, retain some superstitious inklings. The feeling that is called eerie came upon him. He closed the door of the room and was coming forward to the dressing table when suddenly he perceived a coiled and blood-stained bandage of linen rag hanging in mid-air between him and the washhand stand. He stared at this in amazement. It was an empty bandage, a bandage properly tied but quite empty. He would have advanced to grasp it, but a touch arrested him and a voice speaking quite close to him. Kemp, said the voice. Eh? said Kemp, astonished. Keep your nerve, said the voice. I'm invisible. Kemp simply stared at the bandage. Invisible, he said. But this is nonsense. It's some trick. He stepped forward suddenly, and his hand extended towards the bandage met invisible fingers. He recoiled at the touch, and his colour changed. Keep steady, Kemp. For God's sake, I want help badly. Stop. The hand gripped his arm. A frantic desire to free himself took possession of Kemp, but the hand of the bandaged arm gripped his shoulder, and he was suddenly tripped and flung backwards onto the bed. Listen to reason, will you, said the voice. If you shout, I'll smash your face. I'm invisible. It's not magic. I am really an invisible man. And I want your help. Don't you remember me, Kemp? Griffin of University College. I'm just an ordinary man, a man you've known, made invisible. Griffin, said Kemp. Griffin, answered the voice. A younger student than you were, you remember Griffin? Almost an albino, pink and white face, red eyes, over six feet high, who won the medal for chemistry. I, I'm confused, said Kemp. My brain is rioting. What has this to do with Griffin? I am Griffin. I am Griffin, your fellow student at University College, said the Invisible Man. It's... it's horrible, said Kemp. But what devilry must happen to make a man invisible? It's no devilry. It's a process sane and intelligible. But I'm wounded and in pain and tired. Great God! Kemp, give me some food and drink. The night is chilly to a man without clothes. Have you got a dressing gown? Kemp walked to a wardrobe and produced a robe of dingy scarlet, then went downstairs to ransack his larder. He came back with some cold cutlets and bread, pulled up a table and placed them before his guest. Of all the strange and wonderful, he began. Exactly. But it's odd I should blunder into your house to get my bandaging. My first stroke of luck. It's a filthy nuisance, my blood showing, isn't it? Quite a clot over there. It's visible as it coagulates, you see. It's only the living tissue I've changed, and only for as long as I'm alive. I'm lucky to have fallen upon you, Kemp. You must help me. I'm in a devilish scrape. I've been mad, I think. The things I've been through, I can't tell you tonight. He groaned suddenly and leaned forward, supporting his invisible head on invisible hands. Kemp, he said, 
I've had no sleep for near three days, except a couple of doses for an hour or so. I must sleep soon. Oh, God. Oh, I want sleep. Well, why not? Have my room. The invisible man seemed to be regarding Kemp. Because I've a particular objection to being caught by my fellow men. Kemp started. Fool that I am, said the invisible man. I've put the idea into your head. Exhausted and wounded as he was, he refused to accept Kemp's word that his freedom should be respected. He examined the two windows of the bedroom, drew up the blinds and opened the sashes to confirm Kemp's statement that a surprise invasion would be impossible. Finally, he expressed himself satisfied. Oh, I'm sorry, said Griffin, if I cannot tell you all that I've done tonight, but I'm worn out. Well, good night then, said Kemp, and shook an invisible hand. Understand me, no attempt to hamper me, or capture me, or... Kemp's face changed a little. I thought I gave you my word, he said. The next morning, Kemp sent his housemaid out to get every one of the morning papers she could. These, containing reports of his guest's escapades, he devoured. He is invisible, he said. And it reads like rage growing to mania. The things he may do. And he's upstairs, free as air. What on earth ought I to do? For instance, would it be a breach of faith if... No. He wrote a note, and before he could change his mind, took an envelope and addressed it to Colonel Aide, Chief Constable Burdock. The invisible man awoke, even as Kemp was doing this. Having dispatched the note, Kemp took him to the Belvedere study for breakfast. Before we can do anything else, he said, I must understand a little more about this invisibility of yours. It's simple enough and credible enough, said the dressing gown figure. <laughs> no doubt to you, but... Kemp laughed. Well, yes, to me it seemed wonderful at first. But now, good God. But we will do great things yet. I came on the stuff first at Chiselstow. I went there after I left London. You know I dropped medicine and took up physics, no? Well, I did. Light fascinated me. Optical density. The whole subject is a network of riddles. And being but two and twenty and full of enthusiasm, I said, I will devote my life to this. This is worthwhile. I went to work. Within six months, I found the general principle of pigments and refraction, a formula, a geometrical expression involving four dimensions. But this was not a method. It was an idea that might lead to a method by which it would be possible without changing any other property of matter, except in some instances colours, to lower the refractive index of a substance, solid or liquid, to that of air, so far as all practical purposes are concerned. But still, I don't quite see, said Kemp. I can understand that thereby you could spoil a valuable stone, but personal invisibility is a far cry. Precisely, said Griffin. But consider, visibility depends on the reaction of visible bodies to light. Let me put the elementary facts to you. You know quite well that either a body absorbs light or it reflects or refracts it or does all these things. If it neither reflects nor refracts, nor absorbs light, it cannot of itself be visible. Yes, said Kemp, that is plain sailing. Any schoolboy nowadays knows that. And here is another fact any schoolboy will know. Paper is made up of transparent fibers. Oil white paper fill up the interstices between the particles with oil so that there is no longer reflection or refraction except at the surfaces, and it becomes as transparent as glass. And not only paper, but cotton fibre, woody fibre, and bone, Kemp, flesh, Kemp, hair, Kemp, nails and nerves, Kemp. In fact, the whole fabric of a man, except the red of his blood and the dark pigment of his hair, are all made up of transparent, colourless tissue. For the most part, the fibres of a living creature are no more opaque than water. Of course, of course, cried Kemp. I was thinking only last night of the sea larvae and the jellyfish. Now you have me. And all that I knew and had in mind a year after I left London, six years ago. But I kept it to myself. 
I had to do my work under frightful disadvantages, but I got nearer and nearer, making my formula into an experiment, a reality. I told no living soul, because I meant to astound the world and become famous at a blow. I took up the question of pigments, and suddenly, not by design, but by accident, I made a discovery in physiology. You know the red colouring matter of blood? It can be made white, colourless, and remain with all the functions it has now. Kemp gave a cry of amazement. The dressing gown rose and began pacing the little study. You may well exclaim. I remember that night. It was late. I worked sometimes till dawn. It came suddenly, splendid and complete, into my mind. One could make an animal, a tissue, transparent. One could make it invisible. All except the pigments. I could be invisible, I said, suddenly realising what it meant to be an albino and to have such knowledge. It was overwhelming. I went and stared out of the great window at the stars. I could be invisible, I repeated. Yet, after three years of secrecy and trouble, I found that to complete it was impossible. Impossible! How? asked Kemp. Money, said the invisible man, and went again to stare out of the window. He turned round abruptly. I robbed the old man, robbed my father. The money was not his. He shot himself. For a moment, Kemp sat in silence, staring at the back of the headless figure at the window. Then he started, struck by a thought, rose, took the invisible man's arm and drew him away. You're tired, he said, and while I sit, you walk about, have my chair. He placed himself between Griffin and the nearest window. For a space, Griffin sat silent, and then he resumed abruptly. I'd left the Chiselstow College already. I now took a room in London, a large unfurnished room in a big ill-managed lodging house in a slum near Great Portland Street. Soon the room was full of the appliances I bought with his money, and the work was going on steadily, successfully drawing near an end. I'll tell you, Kemp, sooner or later, all the complicated processes. It took two little dynamos, principally, and these I worked with a cheap gas engine. My first experiment was with a bit of white wool fabric. It was the strangest thing in the world to see it soft and white in the flicker of the flashes, and then to watch it fade like a wreath of smoke and vanish. I could scarcely believe I had done it. I put my hand into the emptiness, and there was the thing as real and tangible as ever. And then came a curious experience. I heard a meow behind me, and turning saw a lean white cat, very dirty, on the sill outside the window. A thought came into my head. Everything is ready for you, I said softly. A and you processed her? asked Kemp. I processed her. It took three or four hours. The bones and sinews and the fat were the last to go. About two in the morning she began meowing about the room. I tried to hush her by talking to her and then I decided to turn her out. She went through the open window, I suppose, for I ceased to hear her wailing. The next day, I began to have trouble with my landlord. What was I doing? Was my gas engine safe? Why was I always alone and secretive? Was it legal? Was it dangerous? His had always been a respectable house. Suddenly my temper gave way. I told him to get out. He began to protest, to jabber of his right of entry. In a moment, I had him by the collar, and he went spinning out into the passage. I slammed and locked the door and sat down, quivering. This brought matters to a crisis. I didn't know what he would do. To move to fresh apartments would have meant delay. Altogether, I had barely 20 pounds left in the world. I couldn't afford that. Vanish. It was irresistible. I hurried out with my three books of notes, written in a code only I could decipher, and directed them from the nearest post office to a house of call for letters and parcels in Great Portland Street. Then, on my return, I set to work upon my preparations. It was all done that evening and night. While I was still sitting under the sickly, drowsy influence of the drugs that decolorize blood, there came a repeated knocking at the door. In a fit of irritation, I rose and went and flung the door wide open. Now then, said I. It was the landlord with a notice of ejectment. He held it out to me, saw something odd about my hands, and lifted his eyes to my face. For a moment, he gaped. 
then gave a sort of cry and went blundering down the dark passage to the stairs. I shut the door, locked it, and went to the looking glass. Then I understood his terror. My face was white, like white stone. But it was horrible, Kemp. I had not expected the suffering. A night of racking anguish, sickness, and fainting. But I stuck to it. I became insensible and woke languid in the darkness. The pain had passed. I thought I was killing myself and didn't care. I shall never forget that dawn and the strange horror of seeing that my hands had become as clouded glass and watching them grow clearer and thinner as the day went by. And that at last I could see the sickly disorder of my room through them, though I closed my transparent eyelids. My limbs became glassy. The bones and arteries faded, vanished, and the little white nerves went last. I struggled up. At first, I was as incapable as a swathed infant, stepping with limbs I couldn't see. I slept during the forenoon, and when I awoke, my strength had returned. As noiselessly as possible, I began to detach the connections of my apparatus. I tossed together some loose paper, straw, packing paper, and so forth in the middle of the room, put the chairs and bedding thereby, and turned on the gas. You set fire to the house, exclaimed Kemp. Of course, it was the only way to cover my trail, and no doubt the place was insured. I slipped the bolts of the front door quietly and went out into the street. I was invisible and my mind was already teeming with plans of all the wild and wonderful things I had now impunity to do. Griffin, the Invisible Man, while on the run from the enraged townsmen of Burdock, had taken refuge in a house on the outskirts of the town, a house which, by what seemed to him a stroke of great good fortune, belonged to one of his contemporaries at medical school, Dr. Kemp. After a night's sleep, Griffin went on with his story, not knowing that the doctor had already betrayed him to the police. In going downstairs for the first time, continued Griffin, I found an unexpected difficulty because I could not see my feet. Indeed, I stumbled twice and there was an unaccustomed clumsiness in gripping the bolt. However, I managed to walk on the level passably well. My mood was one of exaltation. I felt as a seeing man might do with padded feet and noiseless clothes in a city of the blind. I experienced a wild impulse to, to jest, to startle people, to clap them on the back, fling people's hats astray, and generally revel in my extraordinary advantage. But hardly had I emerged upon Great Portland Street when I heard a clashing concussion and was hit violently behind. Turning, I saw a man carrying a basket of soda water siphons and looking in amazement at his burden. Although the blow had really hurt me, I found something so irresistible in his astonishment that I laughed aloud. The devil's in the basket, I said, and suddenly twisted it out of his hand. He let go incontinently and I swung the whole weight up into the air but a fool of a cabman standing outside a public house made a sudden rush for this, and his extended fingers caught me with excruciating violence under the ear. I let the hole down with a smash on the cabman, and then, with shouts and the clatter of feet about me, people coming out of shops, vehicles pulling up, I realised what I'd done for myself, and, cursing my folly, backed against the shop window and prepared to dodge out of the ensuing confusion. In a moment I should be wedged into a crowd and inevitably discovered. I pushed by a butcher's boy, hurried straight across the road, which was happily clear, and hardly heeding which way I went, plunged into the afternoon throng of Oxford Street. I tried to get into the stream of people, but they were too thick for me, and in a moment my heels were being trodden upon. I took to the gutter, the roughness of which I found painful to my feet, and forthwith the shaft of a crawling hansom dug me forcibly under the shoulder blade, reminding me that I was already bruised severely. I staggered out of the way of the cab, avoided the perambulator by a convulsive movement, and found myself behind the hansom. A happy thought saved me, and as this drove slowly along, I followed in its immediate wake, trembling and astonished at the turn of my adventure. 
and not only trembling, but shivering. It was a bright day in January, and I was stark naked, and the thin slime of mud that covered the road was near freezing. Foolishly, I had not reckoned that, transparent or not, I was still susceptible to the weather and all its consequences. At the westward corner of Bloomsbury Square, to which I fled to gain quiet, a little white dog ran out and made for me nose down. I had never realised before, but the nose is to the mind of a dog what the eye is to the mind of a man. Dogs perceive the scent of a man moving as men perceive his visible appearance. This brute began barking and leaping, showing only too plainly that he was aware of me. I crossed Great Russell Street and went some way along Montague Street before I realised what I was running towards. Then I became aware of a blare of music, and looking along the street I saw a number of people advancing out of Russell Square, red jerseys and the banner of the Salvation Army to the fore. Such a crowd chanting in the roadway and spilling onto the pavement I could not hope to penetrate. So, deciding on the spur of the moment, I ran up the white steps of a house facing the museum railings and stood there until the crowd should have passed. Happily, the dog stopped at the noise of the band and ran back to Bloomsbury Square. On came the band, bawling with unconscious irony some hymn about when shall we see his face. Thud, thud, thud came the drum, and for the moment I didn't notice two urchins stopping at the railing by me. See them foot marks, said one. Bear, like what you makes in mud. I looked down and saw the youngsters had stopped and were gaping at the muddy footmarks I'd left behind me up the newly whitened steps. Is a barefoot man gone up them steps, or I don't know nothing, said one. And he ain't never come down again. And his foot was a bleeding. The thick of the crowd had already passed. Look you there, Ted, quoth the younger of the detectives, and pointed straight at my feet. I looked down and saw at once the dim suggestion of their outlines sketched in splashes of mud. For a moment I was paralysed. Why, that's rum, said the other, dashed rum. It's just like the ghost of a foot, isn't it? He hesitated and advanced with outstretched hand. I made a step, the boy started back with an exclamation, and with a rapid movement I swung myself over into the portico of the next house. But the smaller boy was sharp enough to follow the movement, and before I was well down the steps and upon the pavement, he'd recovered from his momentary astonishment and was shouting out that the feet had gone over the wall. They rushed round and saw my new footmarks flash into being on the lower step and upon the pavement. What's up? asked someone. Feet! Look! Feet! Running! Everybody in the road except my three pursuers was pouring after the Salvation Army, and this flow not only impeded me, but them. I got through, and in another moment I was running headlong round the circuit of Russell Square with six or seven astonished people following my footmarks. Twice I doubled round corners, thrice I crossed the road and came back on my tracks, and then, as my feet grew hot and dry, the damp impressions began to fade. At last I had breathing space, rubbed my feet clean with my hands, and so got away altogether. The last I saw of the chase was a little group of a dozen people studying with infinite perplexity a slowly drying footprint that had resulted from a puddle in Tavistock Square. This running warmed me to a certain extent. I went on with better courage through the maze of less frequented roads. Once or twice accidental collisions occurred and I left people amazed with unaccountable curses ringing in their ears. Then came something silent and quiet upon my face and across the square fell a thin veil of slowly falling flakes of snow. I had caught a cold and do as I would, I could not avoid an occasional sneeze. And every dog that came in sight with its pointing nose and curious sniffing was a terror to me. Then came men and boys running and shouting as they ran. It was a fire. They ran in the direction of my lodging, and looking back down the street, I saw a mass of black smoke streaming up above the roofs and telephone wires. It was, I felt assured, my lodging that was burning. My clothes, apparatus, all my resources, except those three volumes of precious notes, were there, burning. I had burnt my boats, if ever a man did. The place was blazing. The invisible man paused and thought. 
Kemp glanced nervously out of the window. Uh, yes, he said. Go on. So, with the beginning of a snowstorm in the air about me, and if it settled on me, it would betray me, weary, cold, painful, inexpressibly wretched, and still but half convinced of my invisible quality, I began this new life to which I am committed. I had no refuge, no appliances, no human being in the whole world in whom I could confide. To have told my secret would have given me away, made a mere show and rarity of me. Nevertheless, I was half-minded to accost some passer-by and throw myself upon his mercy. But I knew too clearly the terror and brutal cruelty my advances would evoke. My sole object, then, was to get shelter from the snow, to get myself covered and warm, and then I might hope to plan. But even to me, an invisible man, the rows of London houses stood latched, barred, and bolted impregnably. Only one thing I could see clearly before me, the cold exposure and misery of the snowstorm at night. I turned down one of the roads leading to Totten Court Road and found myself outside Omnium's, the big establishment where everything is to be bought. I contrived to enter and prowled restlessly about until I came upon a huge section in an upper floor containing multitudes of bedsteads, and over these I clambered and found a resting place at last among a huge pile of folded mattresses. The place was already lit up and agreeably warm, and I decided to remain in hiding where I was until closing time. Then I should be able, I thought, to rob the place for food and clothes. My idea was to procure clothing to make myself a muffled but acceptable figure, to get money, and then to recover my books, take a lodging somewhere, and elaborate plans for the realisation of the advantages my invisibility gave me over my fellow men. Closing time arrived, and silence came upon the place. I found myself wandering through the vast and intricate shops, galleries and showrooms. I found warm underwear and socks. Then I went to the clothing place and got trousers, a lounge jacket and a slouch hat. I began to feel a human being again, and my next thought was food. Upstairs was a refreshment department, and there I got cold meat. There was coffee in the urn, and I lit the gas and warmed it up again, and altogether I didn't do badly. Afterwards, prowling through the place, I came across the toy department and had a brilliant idea. I found some artificial noses, and I thought of dark spectacles, but Omniums had no optical department. Finally, I went to sleep in a heap of down quilts, very warm and comfortable. My last thoughts before sleeping were the most agreeable I'd had since the change. I was in a state of physical serenity, and that was reflected in my mind. I thought that I should be able to slip out unobserved in the morning with my clothes upon me, muffling my face with a white wrapper I had taken, purchase spectacles with the money I had stolen, and so complete my disguise. When I woke, it was morning and I saw two men approaching. I scrambled to my feet, looking about me for some way of escape, and even as I did so, the sound of my movement made them aware of me. Who's that? cried one. And stop there, shouted the other. I dashed round a corner and ran full tilt, a faceless figure, mind you, into a lanky lad of fifteen. He yelled, and I bowled him over, rushed past him, turned another corner, and by a happy inspiration threw myself flat behind a counter. In another moment, feet went running past, and I heard voices shouting, All hands to the doors! Lying on the ground, I felt scared out of my wits, but, odd as it may seem, it didn't occur to me at the moment to take off my clothes as I should have done. I'd made up my mind, I suppose, to get away in them, and that ruled me. And then, down the vista of the counters came a bawling of, Here he is! I sprang to my feet, whipped the chair off the counter, and sent it whirling at the fool who'd shouted. I ran into the refreshment place, and there was a shop assistant who took up the chase. I made one last desperate turn and found myself among lamps and ironmongery. I went behind the counter of this and waited for the man, and as he bolted in at the head of the chase, I doubled him up with a lamp. Down he went, and I, crouching behind the counter, began whipping off my clothes as fast as I could. Coat, jacket, trousers, shoes were all right, but a lamb's wool vest fits a man like a skin. I heard more men coming. The assistant was lying quiet on the other side of the counter, stunned or scared, speechless. And I had to make another dash for it, like a rabbit hunted out of a woodpile. This way, policeman! I heard someone shouting. I found myself in my bedstead showroom again, and at the end of a wilderness of wardrobes. 
I rushed among them, went flat, got rid of my vest and stood a free man again, panting and scared as the policeman and three stormen came round the corner. They made a rush for the vest and pants. He must be somewhere here, shouted one young man, but they didn't find me all the same. I stood watching them hunt for me for a time, cursing my ill luck in losing the clothes. Then I went to the refreshment room and sat down by the fire to consider my position. I decided that the emporium was hopeless. I went out again into the street, exasperated at my want of success, and with only the vaguest plan of action in my mind. You begin to realize now, said the invisible man to Dr. Kemp, the full disadvantage of my condition. I had no shelter, no covering. To get clothing was to forgo all my advantage, to make myself a strange and terrible thing. The snow had warned me of other dangers. I couldn't go abroad in snow. It would settle on me and expose me. Rain, too, would make me a watery outline, a glistening surface of a man, a bubble. And fog. I should be like a fainter bubble in fog, a surface, a greasy glimmer of humanity. Moreover, as I went abroad in the London air, I gathered dirt about my ankles, floating smuts and dust upon my skin. I didn't know how long it'd be before I became visible from that cause alone. But I could see clearly it couldn't be very long. Not in London, at any rate. My most immediate problem was to get clothing. I made my way circuitously towards the back streets north of the Strand, for I remembered, though not very distinctly where, that some theatrical costumiers had shops in that district. The day was cold, with a nipping wind down the northward running streets. I walked fast to avoid being overtaken. Every crossing was a danger, every passenger a thing to watch alertly. One man, as I was about to pass him at the top of Bedford Street, turned upon me abruptly and came into me, sending me into the road and almost under the wheel of a passing hansom. I was so unnerved by this encounter that I went into Cotton Garden Market and sat down for some time in a quiet corner by a stall of violets, panting and trembling. My cold was getting worse and I had to leave after a time, lest my sneezes should attract attention. At last I reached the object of my quest, a dirty, fly-blown little shop in a byway near Drury Lane, with a window full of tinsel robes and wigs. The shop was old-fashioned and low and dark, and the house rose above it for four stories, dark and dismal. I peered through the window, and seeing no one within, entered. The opening of the door set a clanging bell ringing. I left it open, and walked round a bare costume stand into a corner behind a cheval glass. For a minute or so, no one came. Then I heard heavy feet striding across a room, and a man appeared in the shop. My plans were now perfectly definite. I proposed to make my way into the house, secrete myself upstairs, watch my opportunity, and when everything was quiet, rummage out a wig, spectacles and costume, and go out into the world, perhaps a grotesque but still a credible figure. And incidentally, of course, I could rob the house of any available money. The man who had entered the shop was a short, slightly hunched, beetle-browed man with long arms and very short, bandy legs. He stared about the shop with an expression of expectation. This gave way to surprise and then anger as he saw the shop empty. Damn the boys, he said, and went to stare up and down the street. Then he came in, kicked the door to with his foot, and went muttering back to the house door. I came forward to follow him, but at the noise of my movement he stopped dead. I did so too, startled by his quickness of ear. He stood, listening for a moment, then slammed the door shut in my face. I stood, hesitating. Suddenly I heard his quick footsteps returning, the door reopened, and he stood looking about the shop like one who was still not satisfied. He'd left the house door open and I slipped in. I was creeping close after him up the staircase when he stopped suddenly so that I nearly blundered into him. He stood looking back right into my face and listening. I could have sworn, he said. He looked up and down the stairs, then grunted and went on up again. His hand was on the handle of a door, and there he stopped again, with the same puzzled anger on his face. 
He was becoming aware of the faint sound of my movements about him. The man must have had diabolically acute hearing. If there's anyone in the house, he cried, and left the threat unfinished. He opened the door of a room and slammed it before I could enter. I resolved to explore the house and spent some time doing so as noiselessly as possible. In one room I found a lot of old clothes. I began routing among these and in my eagerness forgot again the evident sharpness of his ears. I heard a stealthy footstep and looking up just in time saw him peeping in at the tumbled heap and holding an old-fashioned revolver in his hand. I edged quietly out of the room but a plank creaked. And then the infernal little brute started going all over the house, revolver in hand, locking door after door and pocketing the keys. When I realised what he was up to, I had a fit of rage. I could hardly control myself sufficiently to watch my opportunity. By this time, I knew he was alone in the house, and so I made no more ado but knocked him on the head. Knocked him on the head, exclaimed Kemp. Yes, stunned him as he was going downstairs. Hit him from behind with a stool that stood on the landing. He went downstairs like a bag of old boots. But I say, the common conventions of humanity are all very well for common people. But the point was, Kemp, that I had to get out of that house in a disguise without him seeing me. I couldn't think of any other way of doing it. And then I, I gagged him with a Louis XIV vest and tied him in a sheet. Tied him up in a sheet? Made a sort of bag of it. It was rather a good idea to keep the idiot scared and quiet and a devilish hard thing to get out of. My dear Kemp, it's no good your sitting and glaring as though I'd done murder. He had his revolver. But still, said Kemp, in England today, and the man was in his own house, and you were, well, robbing. Robbing? Confound it, you'll call me a thief next. Surely, Kemp, you're not fool enough to dance on the old strings. Can't you see my position? And his, too, said Kemp. The invisible man stood up sharply. What are you trying to say? Kemp's face grew a trifle hard. He was about to speak, but checked himself. I suppose, after all, the thing had to be done. You were in a fix. But still, of course I was in a fix, an infernal fix. And he made me wild, too, hunting me about the house, fooling about with his revolver, locking and unlocking doors. He was simply exasperating. You don't blame me, do you? You don't blame me? I never blame anyone, said Kemp. It's quite out of fashion. What did you do next? I was hungry. Downstairs I found a loaf and some rank cheese, more than sufficient to satisfy my hunger. I took some brandy and water, and then I began a systematic search of the place. Everything that could be of service to me I collected in the clothes storeroom, and then I made a deliberate selection. I found a brown velvet jacket which fitted me quite well, and to that I added trousers, waistcoat, and a soft felt hat. I had thought of painting and powdering my face and all that there was to show of me in order to render myself visible, but the disadvantage of this lay in the fact that I should require turpentine and other appliances, and a considerable amount of time before I could vanish again. So, finally, I chose a nose of the better type, slightly grotesque, but not more so than that of many human beings. Dark glasses, whiskers, and a wig. I could find no underclothing, but that I could buy subsequently, and for the time I swathed myself in calico dominoes and some white cashmere scarves. In the desk in the shop were three sovereigns and about thirty shillings worth of silver, and in the locked cupboard I forced open in the inner room were eight pounds in gold. I could go forth into the world again equipped. Then came a curious hesitation. Was my appearance really credible? I tried myself with a little bedroom looking glass, inspecting myself from every point of view to discover any forgotten chink, but it all seemed sound. I was grotesque to the theatrical pitch a stage miser, but I was certainly not a physical impossibility. Gathering confidence, I took my looking-glass down into the shop, pulled down the blinds, and surveyed myself from every point of view with the help of the cheval glass in the corner. I spent some minutes screwing up my courage, then unlocked the shop door and marched out into the street, leaving the little man to get out of his sheet again when he liked. In five minutes, a dozen turnings intervened between me and the costumier's shop, no one appeared to notice me very pointedly. My last difficulty seemed overcome.
he stopped again. And you troubled no more about the old man, said Kemp? No, said the invisible man. I suppose he untied himself or kicked himself free. He became silent and went to the window and stared out. Uh, what happened when you went out into the Strand? Oh, disillusionment again. I thought my troubles were over. I thought I had impunity to do whatever I chose, everything, save give away my secret. So I thought whatever I did, whatever the consequences might be, was nothing to me. I had merely to fling aside my garments and vanish. No person could hold me. I could take my money where I found it. I decided to treat myself to a sumptuous feast and then put up at a good hotel and accumulate a new outfit of property. I felt amazingly confident. It's not particularly pleasant to recall that I was an ass. I went into a place and was already ordering lunch when it occurred to me that I couldn't eat unless I exposed my invisible face. I finished ordering the lunch, told the man I should be back in ten minutes and went out exasperated. I don't know if you've ever been disappointed in your appetite. <laughs> not quite so badly, said Kemp, but I can imagine it. I could have smashed the silly devils. At last, faint with the desire for appetizing food, I went into another place and demanded a private room. I am disfigured, I said, badly. They looked at me curiously, but of course it was not their affair, and so at last I got my lunch. It was not particularly well served, but it sufficed. And when I'd had it, I sat over a cigar, trying to plan my line of action. Outside, a snowstorm was beginning. The more I thought over it, Kemp, the more I realized what a helpless absurdity an invisible man was in a cold and dirty climate and a crowded, civilized city. Before I made this mad experiment, I dreamt of a thousand advantages. That afternoon, it seemed all disappointment. I went over a list of things a man reckons desirable. No doubt invisibility made it possible to get them, but it made it impossible to enjoy them once they were got. Ambition. What was the good of pride of place when you couldn't appear there? I had no taste for politics, for the blackguardism of fame, for philanthropy, for sport. What was I to do? And for this, I had become a wrapped up mystery, a swathed and bandaged caricature of a man. He paused, and his attitude suggested a roving glance at the window. But how did you get to Iping? said Kemp, anxious to keep his guest busy talking. I went there to work. I had one hope. It was a, a half idea. I have it still. It's a full-blown idea now. A way of getting back, of restoring what I've done, when I choose, when I've done all I mean to do invisibly. And that is what I chiefly want to talk to you about now. You went uh, straight to Iping? Yes. I simply had to get my luggage, my three volumes of memoranda, order a quantity of chemicals to work out this idea of mine. I'll show you the calculations as soon as I get my books, and then set off. I remember the snowstorm now, the accursed bother it was to keep the snow from damping my pissed nose. At the end, said Kemp, the day before yesterday, when they found you out, you rather, uh, to judge by the papers. I did, rather. I clean lost my temper. The fools, why couldn't they leave me alone? By heaven, Kemp, men of your stamp don't know what rage is. To have worked for years, to have planned and plotted, and then to get some fumbling, purblind idiot messing across your course. Every conceivable sort of silly creature that has ever been created has been sent across me. If I have much more of it, I shall go wild. I shall stop mowing them. As it is, they've made things a thousand times more difficult. Dr. Kemp, awaiting the arrival of the chief constable in answer to his summons, tried to keep the invisible man talking. Now, Griffin, he said, with a side glance out of the window, what are we to do? He moved nearer to his guest to prevent the possibility of a sudden glimpse of the three men who were advancing up the hill road. What were you planning to do heading for Burdock? I was going to clear out of the country, but I've altered that plan since seeing you. 
I thought it would be wise, now the weather is hot and invisibility possible, to make for the south, especially as my secret was known and everyone would be on the lookout for a masked and muffled man. You have a line of steamers from here to France. My idea was to get aboard one. Thence I could go by train into Spain or else to Algiers. It wouldn't be difficult. There a man might be invisible always and yet live. But blundering into your house, Kemp, changes all my plans. For you are a man that can understand. In spite of all that has happened, of the loss of my books, of what I've suffered, there still remain great possibilities, huge possibilities. You've told no one I'm here. Kemp hesitated. That was implied, he said. No one, insisted Griffin. Not a soul. I made a mistake, Kemp, a huge mistake in carrying through this thing alone. I wasted strength, time, opportunities. Alone, it's wonderful how little a man can do alone. To rob a little, to hurt a little, and there's the end. What I want, Kemp, is a helper and a hiding place. An arrangement whereby I can sleep and eat and rest in peace unsuspected. I must have a confederate. With a confederate, with food and rest, a thousand... We had to consider all, all that it does not mean. Advantage for eavesdropping and so forth, one makes sounds. It's of little help, a little help perhaps, in housebreaking. Once you've caught me, you would easily imprison me. But on the other hand, I am hard to catch. This invisibility, in fact, is only good in two cases. It's useful in getting away, it's useful in approaching. It's particularly useful, therefore, in killing. I can walk round a man, whatever weapon he has, choose my point, strike as I like, escape as I like. Kemp's hand went to his moustache. Was that a movement downstairs? I'm uh, listening to your plan, Griffin, but I'm not agreeing, mind. Why killing? Not wanton killing, but judicious slaying. The point is this. They know there is an invisible man, and that invisible man, Kemp, must now establish a reign of terror. Yes, no doubt, it's startling, but I mean it. A reign of terror. He must take some town like your burdock and terrify and dominate it. He must issue his orders. He can do that in a thousand ways. Scraps of paper thrust under doors would suffice. And all who disobey his orders, he must kill. Kemp was no longer listening to Griffin, but to the sound of the front door opening and closing. It uh, seems to me, Griffin, he said, to cover his wandering attention, that your confederate would be in a difficult position. No one would know he was a confederate, said the invisible man eagerly. And then suddenly, shh. What's that downstairs? Uh, nothing, said Kemp. I don't agree to this, Griffin. Understand me, I don't agree to this. Why dream of playing a game against the race? Don't be a lone wolf. Publish your results. Take the world, take the nation at least, into your confidence. Think what you might do with a million helpers. The invisible man interrupted. There are footsteps coming upstairs. Nonsense, said Kemp. Let me see. He advanced, arm extended to the door. Kemp hesitated for a second, then moved to intercept him. Traitor, cried the invisible man. And suddenly the dressing gown sat down and unseen hands began to remove socks and slippers. Kemp had made three steps to the door when the figure, now legless, sprang up with a shout. As Kemp flung the door open, there came a sound of hurrying feet and voices downstairs. With a quick movement, he thrust the invisible man back, rushed outside and slammed the door. In another moment, Griffin would have been a prisoner in the room, save for one little thing. The key had been slipped in hastily that morning. As Kemp slammed the door... It fell up on the carpet. Kemp tried to grip the door handle with both hands and for a moment stood tugging. The door gave six inches. He got it closed again. A second time it was jerked a foot wide and as the dressing gown wedged itself into the opening his throat was gripped by invisible fingers and he left his hold on the handle to defend himself. He was forced back, tripped and pitched heavily into the corner of the landing. The empty dressing gown was flung on top of him. Halfway up the staircase, Colonel Aidy, the chief of the Burdock police, was staring aghast. He saw Kemp reel, rush forward, and go down again, felled like an ox. Then suddenly he was struck violently by nothing. It seemed leapt upon him, there was a grip on his throat and a knee in his groin, and he was hurled headlong down the stairs. 
a ghostly patter past him, he heard the two police officers in the hall shout and run, and the front door of the house slammed violently. Adie sat up, staring. He saw Kemp staggering down the staircase, dusty and dishevelled. My God, cried Kemp, the game's up. He's gone. He's mad, inhuman. He's pure selfishness. He thinks of nothing but his own advantage, his own safety. I've listened to such a story this morning of brutal self-seeking. He's wounded men. He will kill them unless we can prevent him. He'll create a panic. Nothing can stop him. He must be caught, said Eddie. That is certain. But how, cried Kemp, and suddenly became full of ideas. You must begin work at once. You must prevent him leaving this district. Once he gets away, he can go through the countryside as he wills, killing and maiming. He dreams of a reign of terror. You must set a watch on trains and roads and shipping. The garrison must be brought in. You must wire for help. Food must be locked up and secured, all food, so that he would have to break his way to get it. The houses everywhere must be barred against him. Heaven send us cold nights and rain. I tell you, Aidy, he is a danger, a disaster. Well, I must go down at once and begin organising, said Aidy. You come too. We must hold a sort of council of war, get the railway managers together. Come along, tell me as we go. What else is there we can do? Dogs, get dogs. They don't see him, but they wind him. Get dogs. Good, said Aidy. Dogs. What else? Put all weapons, all implements that might be weapons, away. He can't carry such things for long, and what he can snatch up and strike men with must be hidden away. Good again. We shall have him yet. And uh, on the roads, said Kemp, and hesitated. Yeah? Broken glass. It's cruel, I know, but think of what he may do. Adie drew the air in between his teeth sharply. It was unsportsmanlike. I don't know. But I'll have broken glass got ready. If he goes too far. The man's inhuman, I tell you. Our only chance is to be ahead. He's cut himself off from mankind. His blood be upon his own head. The invisible man seems to have rushed out of Kemp's house in a state of blind fury. A little child playing near Kemp's gateway was violently caught up and thrown aside so that its ankle was broken. Thereafter, for some hours, he passed out of human perception. But one can imagine him hurrying through the hot June afternoon up the hill and onto the open downland behind Burdock, raging and despairing at his intolerable fate, and sheltering at last, heated and weary amid the thickets of Hintondean, to piece together again his shattered schemes against his species. A growing multitude of men scattered over the countryside were busy. In the morning, he'd still been simply a legend, a terror. In the afternoon, by virtue chiefly of Kemp's dryly worded proclamation, he was presented as a tangible antagonist, to be wounded, captured, or overcome. And the countryside began organising itself with inconceivable rapidity. By two o'clock even, he might still have removed himself out of the district by getting aboard a train, but after two, that became impossible. Every passenger train along the lines on the great parallelogram between Southampton, Winchester, Brighton and Horsham travelled with locked doors and the goods traffic was almost entirely suspended. And in the great circle of 20 miles around Burdock, men armed with guns and bludgeons were presently setting out in groups of three and four with dogs to beat roads and fields. Mounted policemen rode along the country lanes, stopping at every cottage and warning the people to lock up their houses and all the elementary schools had broken up by three o'clock, and the children, scared and keeping together in groups, were hurrying home. Kemp's proclamation, signed indeed by Adie, was posted over almost the whole district by four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Before nightfall, a thrill of horror went through the whole watching, nervous countryside, and going from whispering mouth to mouth over the length and breadth of the country, there passed the story of the murder of Mr. Wicksteed. Nothing is known of the details of that encounter. It occurred on the edge of a gravel pit, not 200 yards from Lord Burdock's lodge gates. Everything points to a desperate struggle. The trampled ground, the numerous wounds Mr. Wicksteed received, his splintered walking stick, but why that attack was made, save in a murderous frenzy, it is impossible to imagine. 
Mr. Wicksteed was a man of 45, steward to Lord Burdock, of inoffensive habits and appearance, and the very last person in the world to provoke such a terrible antagonist. Against him, the invisible man used an iron rod, dragged from a piece of broken fence. He stopped this quiet man going quietly home to his midday meal, attacked him, beat down his feeble defence, broke his arm, felled him, and smashed his head. The gravel pit was not in Mr Wicksteed's direct path home, but nearly a couple of hundred yards out of his way. A little girl asserted that, going to her afternoon school, she saw the murdered man trotting in a peculiar manner across a field towards the gravel pit. Her pantomime of his action suggests a man pursuing something on the ground before him and striking at it ever and again with his walking stick. She was the last person to see him alive. The position in which Wicksteed's body was found suggests that he had the ill luck to drive his quarry into a corner between a drift of stinging nettles and the gravel pit. To those who appreciate the extraordinary irascibility of the invisible man, the rest of the encounter will be easy to imagine. After the murder of Mr Wicksteed, he would seem to have struck across country towards the downland. There's a story of a voice heard about sunset by a couple of men in the field near Fern Bottom. It was wailing and laughing, sobbing and groaning, and ever and again it shouted. It drove up across the middle of a clover field and died away towards the hill. In the interim, the invisible man must have learnt something of the rapid use Kemp had made of his confidences. He must have found houses locked and secured. He may have loitered about railway stations and prowled about inns. And no doubt he read the proclamations and realised something of the nature of the campaign against him. And as the evening advanced, the fields became dotted with groups of three or four men and noisy with the yelping of dogs. And these man-hunters had particular instructions in the case of an encounter as to the way they should support one another. But he avoided them all. We may understand something of his exasperation, made nonetheless bitter by the knowledge that he himself had supplied the information, now being used so remorselessly against him. For that day at least, perhaps he was daunted and lost heart. But in the night, he must have eaten and slept. For next morning, he was himself again, active, powerful, angry and malignant prepared for his last great struggle against the world. Dr. Kemp was reading a strange missive written in pencil on a greasy sheet of paper. You have been amazingly energetic and clever, this letter ran. You are against me, but I have found food in spite of you. I have slept in spite of you and the game is only beginning. This announces the first day of the terror. Burdock is no longer under the Queen, tell your Colonel of Police and the rest of them. It is under me, the terror. To begin with, the rule will be easy. The first day there will be one execution for the sake of example. A man named Kemp. Today, Kemp is to die. Kemp read this letter twice. It's no hoax, he said. It's his voice, and he means it. He turned the folded sheet over and saw on the addressed side of it the postmark Hinton Dean. He rang for his housekeeper and told her to go round the house at once, examine all the fastenings of the windows and close all the shutters. From a locked drawer in his bedroom, he took a little revolver examined it carefully, and put it into the pocket of his lounge jacket. He wrote a note to Colonel Adey and gave it to his servant to take, with explicit instructions as to her way of leaving the house. There is no danger, he said, and added a mental reservation, to you. We will have him, he said to himself, and I am the bait. He will come too far. He went up to the Belvedere, carefully shutting every door after him. It's a game, an odd game, but the chances are all for me, Mr. Griffin, in spite of your invisibility. He went close to the window. I wonder, he may be watching me now. 
Something rapped smartly against the brickwork over the frame and made him start back violently. I'm getting nervous, said Kemp. But it was five minutes before he went to the window again. It must have been a sparrow. Presently he heard the front doorbell ringing and hurried downstairs. He unbolted and unlocked the door and opened it cautiously without showing himself. It was Adie. Your servants had that note of yours taken away from her. He's close about here. Let me in. Kemp released the chain, and Adie entered through as narrow an opening as possible. Note was snatched out of her hand. Scared her horribly. He's down to the station. Hysterics. He's close by. What was the note about? Kemp swore. What a fool I was. I might have known. It's not an hour's walk from Hinton Dean. Look here, he said, and led the way into his study. He handed Ady the invisible man's letter. Ady read it and whistled softly. And you? He proposed a trap, like a fool. A resounding smash of glass came from upstairs. Ady had a silvery glimpse of the revolver out of Kemp's pocket. It's a window upstairs, said Kemp, and led the way up. There came a second crash while they were still on the staircase. When they reached the study, they found two or three of the windows smashed, half the room littered with broken glass, and one big flint lying on the writing table. The two men stopped in the doorway, contemplating the wreckage. As they did so, the third window went with a snap like a pistol, hung starred for a moment, and collapsed in jagged, shivering triangles into the room. What's this for? said Eddie. It's a beginning, said Kemp. There's no way of climbing up here. Not for a cat. No shutters. Not here. All the downstairs rooms. One more window went the way of its fellows. That must be another of the bedrooms. He's going to do all the house. But he's a fool. The shutters are up downstairs. The glass will fall outside. The two men stood on the landing, perplexed. I have it, said Eddie. Let me have a stick or something. I'll go down to the station and get the bloodhounds put on. That ought to settle him. You haven't a revolver. Kemp's hand went to his pocket. Then he hesitated. I haven't one, at least to spare. I'll bring it back, said Hedy. You'll be safe here. Kemp, ashamed of his momentary lapse from truthfulness, handed him the weapon. Now for the door, said Hedy. As they stood hesitating in the hall, they heard another of the bedroom windows crack and smash. Kemp went to the door and began to slip the bolts as silently as possible. His face was a little paler than usual. You must step straight out, he said. In another moment, Aidy was on the doorstep and the bolts were dropping back into the stables. He hesitated for a moment, feeling more comfortable with his back against the door. Then he marched upright and square down the steps. He crossed the lawn and approached the gate. A little breeze seemed to ripple over the grass. Something moved near him. Stop, said a voice, and Eddie stopped dead. His hand tightened on the revolver. Well, said Eddie, white and grim and every nerve tense. Oblige me by going back to the house, said the voice, as tense and grim as Eddie's. Sorry, said Eddie, a little hoarsely. The voice was on his left front, he thought. Suppose he were to take his luck with a shot. What are you going for, said the voice. Eddie hesitated. Where I go is my own business. The words were still on his lips. When an arm came round his neck, his back felt a knee and he was sprawling backward. He drew clumsily and fired absurdly. And in another moment he was struck in the mouth and the revolver rested from his grip. He made a vain clutch at a slippery limb, tried to struggle up and fell back. Damn, said Eddie. The voice laughed. I'd kill you now, it wasn't the waste of a bullet, it said. Eddie saw the revolver in midair, six feet off, covering him. Well, he said, sitting up. Get up, said the voice. Eddie got up. Attention, said the voice, and then firmly. Don't try any games. Remember, I can see your face if you can't see mine. You've got to go back to the house. You won't let me in. That's a pity. I've got no quarrel with you. Eddie glanced away from the barrel of the revolver and saw the sea far off, very blue and dark under the midday sun. 
the smooth green down, the white cliff at the head, and suddenly he knew that life was very sweet. His eyes came back to this little metal thing hanging between heaven and earth six feet away. What am I to do? he said sullenly. What am I to do? asked the invisible man. If you get help? No. The only thing is for you to go back. Well, I'll try. If he lets me in, will you promise not to rush the door? I've no quarrel with you, said the voice. Kemp had hurried upstairs after letting Eddie out, and now crouching among the broken glass and peering cautiously over the edge of the study windowsill, he saw Eddie stand parleying with the unseen. Why doesn't he fire? whispered Kemp to himself. Then the revolver moved a little, and the glint of the sunlight flashed in Kemp's eyes. He shaded his eyes and tried to see the course of the blinding beam. Surely, he said, Eddie has given up the revolver. Promise not to rush the door, Eddie was saying. Don't push a winning game too far. Give a man a chance. You go back to the house. I tell you flatly, I will not promise anything. Eddie's decision seemed suddenly made. He turned towards the house, walking slowly with his hands behind him. Kemp watched from the study window, puzzled. The revolver vanished, flashed again into sight, vanished again, and became evident as a little dark object following Adie. Then things happened very quickly. Adie leapt backwards, swung round, clutched at this little object, missed it, threw up his hands and fell forward on his face, leaving a little puff of blue in the air. Kemp didn't hear the sound of the shot. Adie writhed, raised himself on one arm, fell forward and lay still. For a space, Kemp remained staring at the quiet carelessness of Adie's attitude. The afternoon was very hot and still. The blinds of all the villas down the hill road were drawn. But in one little green summer house was a white figure, apparently an old man, asleep. Kemp scrutinized the surroundings of the house for a glimpse of the revolver, but it had vanished. There came a ringing and knocking at the front door that grew at last tumultuous. This was followed by a silence. Kemp armed himself with his bedroom poker and went to examine the interior fastenings on the ground floor windows again. Everything was safe and quiet. He returned to the Belvedere. Adie lay motionless over the edge of the gravel just as he'd fallen. Coming along the road by the villas were the housemaid and two policemen. They seemed very slow in approaching. Kemp wondered what his antagonist was doing. There was a sudden smash from below. He hesitated and went downstairs again. Immediately the house resounded with heavy blows and the splintering of wood. He heard a smash and the distinctive clang of the iron fastenings on the shutters. As he opened the kitchen door, the shutters split and came flying inward. They'd been driven in with an axe, and now the axe was descending in sweeping blows upon the window frame and iron bars defending it. Kemp dodged back. The revolver cracked just too late, and a splinter from the edge of the closing door flashed over his head. He slammed and locked the door, and as he stood outside, he heard Griffin shouting and laughing. Then the blows of the axe with their splitting and smashing accompaniments were resumed. Kemp stood in the passage trying to think. In a moment, the invisible man would be in the kitchen. A ringing came at the front door again. It would be the policeman. He ran into the hall, put up the chain and drew the bolts. He made the girl speak before he dropped the chain and the three people blundered in. Suddenly the house was full of the invisible man's resounding blows on the kitchen door. They heard the door give. This way, cried Kemp, and bundled the policeman into the dining room. He handed the poker he carried to one of the policemen and the dining room one to another. Kemp suddenly flung himself backward. One policeman ducked and caught the axe on his poker. The pistol fired again. The second policeman brought his poker down on the little weapon as one might knock down a wasp and sent it rattling to the floor. At the first clash, the girl screamed and stood screaming for a moment by the fireplace. Then she ran to open the shutters. The axe receded into the passage and fell to a position about two feet from the ground. They could hear the invisible man breathing. Stand away, you two, he said. I want that man Kemp. We want you, said the first policeman, making a quick step forward and wiping his poker at the voice. The invisible man must have started back as he blundered into the umbrella stand in the hall. As the policeman staggered with the swing of the blow he'd aimed, 
the invisible man countered with the axe. The helmet crumpled like paper, and the blow sent the man spinning to the floor. But the second policeman, aiming behind the axe with his poker, hit something soft that snapped. There was a sharp exclamation of pain, and the axe fell to the ground. The policeman put his foot on the axe and struck again. Then he stood, listening, intent for the slightest movement. Behind him, he heard the dining room window open and a quick rush of feet within. His companion rolled over and sat up with the blood running down between his eye and ear. Where is he? he asked. Don't know. I've hit him. He's standing somewhere in the hall, unless he slipped past you. Dr. Kemp, sir. Dr. Kemp. The second policeman stood up. The faint pad of bare feet could be heard somewhere in the house. And the first policeman flung his poker. It smashed a gas bracket. He made as if to pursue the invisible man. Then he thought better of it and stepped into the dining room. Dr. Kemp, he began, and stopped short. The dining room window was wide open, and neither housemaid nor Kemp was to be seen. He's run off, said the first policeman, as his companion struggled painfully to his feet. He's run off to save our lives. Dr. Kemp's a hero. The second policeman's opinion of Kemp was terse and vivid. Mr. Helas, Dr. Kemp's nearest neighbour among the villa holders, was asleep in his summer house when the siege of Kemp's house began. Mr. Helas was one of the sturdy majority who refused to believe in all this nonsense about an invisible man. His wife, however, as he was to be reminded subsequently, did. Mr. Helas insisted upon walking about his garden just as if nothing was the matter, and he went to sleep in the afternoon in accordance with the custom of years. He slept through the smashing of the windows, and then woke up suddenly with a curious persuasion of something wrong. He looked across at Kemp's house, rubbed his eyes, and looked again. The house, with every window broken, looked as though it had been deserted for weeks after a violent riot. He looked at his watch. I could have sworn it was all right twenty minutes ago. He became aware of a measured concussion and the clash of glass far away in the distance. And then, as he sat open-mouthed, came a still more wonderful thing. The shutters of the dining room window were flung open violently, and the housemaid appeared, struggling in a frantic manner to throw up the sash. Suddenly, a man appeared beside her, helping her, Dr. Kemp. In another moment, the window was open and the housemaid was struggling out. She pitched forward and vanished among the shrubs. Mr. Helas stood up, exclaiming vaguely and vehemently at all these wonderful things. He saw Kemp stand on the sill, spring from the window, and reappear almost instantaneously, running along a path in the shrubbery, and stooping as he ran, like a man who evades observation. He vanished behind a laburnum and reappeared again, clambering a fence that abutted on the open down. In a second, he tumbled over and was running at a tremendous pace down the slope towards Mr. Helas. Lord, cried Mr. Helas, struck with an idea. It's that invisible man, brute. It's true, after all. With Mr. Helas to think things like that was to act. And his wife, watching him from the top window, was amazed to see him come pelting towards the house at a good nine miles an hour. There was a slamming of doors, a ringing of bells, and the voice of Mr. Helas bellowing like a bull. Shut the doors! Shut the windows! Shut everything! The invisible man is coming! Instantly the house was full of screams and directions and scurrying feet. He himself ran to shut the French windows that opened onto the veranda. And as he did so, Kemp's head and shoulders and knee appeared over the edge of the garden fence. In another moment, Kemp had ploughed through the asparagus and was running across the tennis lawn to the house. You can't come in, said Mr. Healer, shooting the bolts. I'm very sorry if he's after you, but you can't come in. Kemp appeared with a face of terror close to the glass, rapping and then shaking frantically at the French windows. Seeing his efforts were useless, he ran along the veranda, vaulted the end and went to hammer at the side door. Then he ran round by the side gate to the front of the house and so into the hill road. And Mr. Healer, staring from his window, had scarcely witnessed Kemp vanish ere the asparagus was being trampled this way and that by feet unseen. At that, Mr. Healer fled precipitately upstairs, and the rest of the chase was beyond his purview. But as he passed the staircase window, he heard the side gate slam. Emerging into the hill road, Kemp naturally took the downward direction. And so it was that he came to run in his own person, the very race he had watched with such a critical eye from the Belvedere study only four days ago. He ran it well for a man out of training, 
and though his face was white, his wits were cooled the last. He ran with wide strides, and wherever a stretch of rough ground intervened, wherever there came a patch of raw flints or a bit of broken glass shone dazzling, he crossed it and left the bare invisible feet that followed to take what line they would. For the first time in his life, Kemp discovered that the hill road was indescribably vast and desolate. Never had there been a slower or more painful method of progression than running. All the gaunt villas sleeping in the afternoon sun looked locked and barred. No doubt they were locked and barred by his own orders, but they might have kept a lookout for an eventuality like this. The town was rising up now. The sea dropped out of sight behind it. People below were stirring. A tram was just arriving at the hill foot. Beyond that was the police station. Were those footsteps he heard behind him? His breath was beginning to soar in his throat. The people below were staring at him. One or two were running. The tram was quite near now. The jolly cricketers was noisily barring its door. Beyond the tram were posts and heaps of gravel, the drainage works. He had a transitory idea of jumping into the tram and slamming the doors. And then he resolved to go for the police station. In another moment, he'd passed the door of the jolly cricketers and was in the blistering fag end of the street among human beings. The tram driver and his helper, astounded by the sight of his furious haste, stood staring with the tram horses unhitched. Farther on, the astonished features of navvies appeared above the mounds of gravel. His pace broke a little, and then he heard the swift pad of his pursuer and leapt forward again. The invisible man, he cried to the navvies, with a vague indicative gesture, and by an inspiration leapt the excavation and placed a burly group between him and the chase. Then, abandoning the idea of the police station, he turned into a little side street, rushed by a greengrocer's cart, hesitated for the tenth of a second at the door of a sweet shop, and then made for the mouth of an alley that ran back into the main hill street again. Two or three little children were playing there, and shrieked and scattered, running at his apparition, and forthwith doors and windows opened and excited mothers screamed for the children to come in. Out Kemp shot into Hill Street once more, 300 yards from the tram line end, and immediately he became aware of a tumultuous noise of people running for their lives. He glanced up the street towards the hill. Hardly a dozen yards off ran a huge navvy, cursing and slashing viciously with his spade. And hard behind him came the tram conductor with his fists clenched. Up the street, others followed these two, striking and shouting. Down towards the town, men and women were running, and he noticed clearly one man coming out of a shop door with a stick in his hand. Spread out! Spread out! cried someone. Kemp suddenly grasped the altered condition of the chase. He stopped and looked round, panting. He's, he's close here, he cried. Form a line! Cross! He was hit hard under the ear and went reeling, trying to face round towards his unseen antagonist. He just managed to keep his feet and he struck a vain counter in the air. Then he was hit again under the jaw and sprawled headlong on the ground. In another moment, a knee compressed his diaphragm and a couple of eager hands gripped his throat. But the grip of one was weaker than the other. He grasped the wrists, heard a cry of pain from his assailant, and then the spade of the navvy came whirling through the air above him and struck something with a dull thud. He felt a drop of moisture on his face. The grip at his throat suddenly relaxed. And with a convulsive effort, Kemp loosed himself, grasped a limp shoulder and rolled uppermost. He gripped the unseen elbows near the ground. I've, I've, I've got him, screamed Kemp. Help, hold, he's, he's down, hold his feet. In another second, there was a simultaneous rush upon the struggle, and a stranger coming into the road suddenly might have thought an exceptionally savage game of rugby football was in progress. And there was no shouting after Kemp's cry, only a sound of blows and feet and heavy breathing. Then came a mighty effort, and the invisible man staggered to his feet with Kemp clutched to him like a hound to a stag. A dozen hands pulled and tore at the unseen. The tram conductor got the neck and wrenched it back. Down went the heap of struggling men again. There was some savage kicking. Then suddenly a wild scream of, Mercy! Mercy! that died down swiftly to a sound like choking. Get back, you fools! cried the muffled voice of Kemp, and there was a vigorous shoving back of stalwart forms. He's hurt, I tell you. Stand back! There was a brief struggle to clear a space, and then the circle of eager faces saw the doctor kneeling, as it seemed, fifteen inches in the air and holding invisible arms to the ground. Behind him, a constable gripped invisible ankles. Don't you leave go of him, said the navvy, holding a blood-stained spade. He's shamming. He's not shamming, said the doctor, cautiously raising his knee. I'll hold him. 
His face was bruised and already turning red. He spoke thickly because of a bleeding lip. He released one hand and seemed to be feeling at the face. The mouth's all wet, he said. And then, good Lord. He knelt again by the side of the thing unseen. There was a pushing and shuffling, a sound of heavy feet as fresh people came to increase the pressure of the crowd. Men were coming out of the houses. The doors of the Jolly Cricketers stood suddenly wide open. Very little was said. Kemp felt about, his hand seeming to pass through the empty air. He's, he's not breathing, he said. And then, I can't feel his heart. Look, look here, whispered an old woman, thrusting out a wrinkled finger. And looking where she pointed, everyone saw, faint and transparent, as though made of glass, so that veins and arteries and bones and nerves could be distinguished. The outline of a hand, a hand limp and prone. It grew clouded and opaque as they stared. Hello, said the constable. Is his feet showing? And so, beginning at his hands and feet, and creeping slowly along his limbs to the vital centres of his body, that strange change to visible fleshiness continued. It was like the slow spreading of a poison. First came the little white veins, tracing a hazy grey sketch of a limb. Then the glassy bones and intricate arteries. Then the flesh and skin. First a faint fogginess, but growing rapidly dense and opaque. And presently they could see his crushed chest and shoulders, and the dim outline of his drawn and battered features. When at last the crowd made way for Kemp to stand erect, there lay, naked and pitiful on the ground, the bruised and broken body of a young man in his thirties. His hair and brow were white, not grey with age, but white with the whiteness of albinism. And his eyes were like garnets. His hands were clenched, his eyes wide open, and his expression was one of anger and dismay. Cover his face, said a man. For God's sake, cover that face. Someone brought a sheet from the Jolly Cricketers, and having covered him, they carried him into the house. And there it was, on a shabby bed in a tawdry, ill-lit bedroom, surrounded by a crowd of ignorant and excited people, broken and wounded, betrayed and unpitied, that Griffin, the first of all men to make himself invisible, Griffin, the most gifted physicist the world has ever seen, ended in infinite disaster, his strange and terrible career. So ends the story of the curious and evil experiment of the invisible man. And if you would learn more of him, you must go to a little inn near Port Stowe and talk to the landlord. The sign of the inn is an empty board, save for a hat and boots. And the name of the inn is the title of this story. The landlord is a short, corpulent little man with a nose of cylindrical protrusion and a sporadic rosiness of visage. On Sunday mornings, while the bar is closed to the outer world, he goes into the little parlour, locks the door, examines the blinds, and even looks under the table. And then, being satisfied of his solitude, he unlocks the cupboard, and a box in the cupboard, and a drawer in that box, and produces three volumes in brown leather, and places them solemnly in the middle of the table. Full of secrets, he says. Wonderful secrets. Lord, once I get the hang of them. So he lapses into a dream, the undying, wonderful dream of his life. And no one, no human being, save Mr. Thomas Marvel, the landlord, knows these books are there. With the subtle secret of invisibility written therein.